Welcome everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. My name is Janet Forrest. I'm one of the adult programs coordinators at the Nantucket Athenaeum along with Daniel Griffin who is on the line. And um, so I, in addition to that, I'm also a certified professional life coach and one of the things I specialize in is helping, pe helping people declutter. And so what I'm going to do is go ahead and share my screen if I can. There we go. Can everyone see that? Yeah. Okay, what I'm actually going to do, there's a lot of us on the call tonight. I'm going to go ahead and mute everyone. Uh, but I will have uh, um, opportunities where you can unmute yourself and ask questions. There we go. Okay. So once again, my name is Janet Forrest. I'm a certified professional life coach. And one of the things I special in is declutter, specialize in is decluttering. And tonight we're gonna be, I'm gonna be straddling two tracks. One is how do you help yourself if you're working on this? And how do you help others? So a lot of times you're in a situation where someone else is trying to declutter and you're supporting them. And um, I'm gonna give you some tips on how to approach that as well. What we're gonna cover tonight and talk about is creating a goal and a plan for decluttering, prepping for the clean out, strategies and tips for sorting and deciding, and overcoming roadblocks. Now, before we move forward, I want to talk about the math and physics of decluttering. This is where a lot of people get head up, held up, and it comes down to just being really honest with yourself and honest with how the universe works. So rule number one, decluttering is only effective when your rate of accumulation is slower than your rate of disposal. One of the first things I ask people about is um, their shopping and purchasing habits and how often they acquire things because you can work as hard as you want to get rid of things, but if you haven't stopped bringing things in, it's going to become a vicious cycle. And there is a book called The Story of Stuff by Annie Leonard. And the analogy she uses is if you come home for, from vacation, your house is flooding. It doesn't make sense to start bailing water. What you want to do is go and find where the water is coming in and shut it off. So think about it as shutting off the faucet before you start getting rid of stuff. Rule number two. The amount of emotional attachment one feels for physical items neither increases nor decreases the square footage of your available space. I understand that people can get very emotionally attached to items. Um, what it's important to remember is you only have so much space within your house or storage unit or whatever space you're working within. And um, this is really where the rubber meets the road is are you willing to work within the space you have? I usually advise people not to take on more space because what happens is you tend to just fill that space. You feel almost like air in a balloon. You take up as much space as avail is available. And rule number three, monetary and sentimental value minus financial, physical, and emotional cost equals the actual value of your stuff. So if you were to think of this just um, in terms of dollar and cents, if you have, say, say you have $10,000 worth of antique furniture in a storage unit, and a 10 by 10 storage unit will run you about $300 a month. So over the course of the year, you're going to spend $3,600. So within three years, you'll spend more money than what you believe that antique furniture is worth. So it's really important to think about what is it costing you to keep the items that you have. And I think the other thing people don't take into consideration, while it's really easy to understand the value, sentimental or otherwise, that you put on items, people don't think about the cost. And there's also not just the financial cost, but the physical and emotional cost. So if you have a basement that's filled with boxes and stuff, and you're constantly navigating that to do your laundry or reach whatever's in your basement, you might run the risk of falling or tripping or it just takes up a lot of um, space in your home and you're constantly navigating that. So that could be, that can take a toll, that can be a cost. And the other piece is the emotional cost. I, I know a lot of people can feel some shame or guilt or frustration or anger over the amount of items that they've accumulated. And while you might not think of it day to day and while you might not be able to put an actual number on it, 
it can have a cost over the course of years or even decades. The other thing that someone brought up actually before we started and what I work with people most on, um, I will get into tips and strategies for decluttering, but what, what trips people up is actually the emotional barriers. And the first barrier tends to be feeling overwhelmed. When people call, one of the first things they say is, I don't even know where to start. I'm so overwhelmed. And what happens is it, sometimes it becomes a monster under the bed scenario where they've put stuff away and they haven't even looked at it or addressed it in so long. And it's become this big, huge thing. So I, would, I usually send people in one of two directions. One is to just start somewhere. Even if you can spend 20 minutes or a half hour and pick a few things to get rid of, sometimes that gets you over that initial hurdle of starting. Um, and, and then you find yourself, you keep going. The other thing that I recommend to people is get a scope of the situation, be willing to face it. And you might look and say, okay, well, I need to hire my friend with a truck to take away some of this old furniture. And then I'll need some help, um, an extra set of hands for this other stuff. And then I have to find out where I can dispose of these other items that um, they can't be donated. I have to get rid of them. So let me get the information I need. So sometimes even just getting the scope of the problem, at least you're working within reality and you're not blowing up, blowing it way out of proportion. Um, another emotional hurdle that once people get over, over the fact that they're overwhelmed is the inability to visualize the end or see progress. And we're going to talk about setting a goal. So when you have a clear vision and you have a plan, you'll both have something to focus on and you'll be able to see progress. And sometimes that can be enough to keep you going. And then uh, decluttering is all about decision making, which can be exhausting. I'll get into that. But decisions can fall into two categories. One is fear-based decisions and one are value-based decisions. Fear-based decisions are based on trying to avoid a possible outcome. Value-based decisions are working towards a goal or a particular value. And the result may be the same, but the energy behind it is different. For instance, say I'm cleaning out um, a room I haven't used in a while and I find a big box of office products that were never touched. Now, a fear-based decision would be, well, I can't possibly get rid of this because at some point I might need an envelope and I won't have it and what am I gonna do? Um, so that's a fear-based decision. You're afraid of not having what you need in the future. A value-based decision might be, I don't like wasting things and I don't like buying new things when I already have them. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna organize this box and put it in a place where I can find it so I'm using what I have instead of buying things I don't need. And that's a value-based decision. Okay, so let's delve in. What you wanna do first, what I recommend people do when they're gonna start decluttering is to create a goal. It should be specific and measurable and it should give you a reference point as you're going through the process. And it will also, um, as I talked about before, it'll create a little bit of motivation. Whereas when you know what you're moving towards, um, you'll be able to keep going. You'll have something you're working towards. You'll see a light at the end of the tunnel. Now, here are a few examples of goals that either clients have had or I thought of. Um, one is to resume reduce storage unit from a 10 by 10 to a 5 by 10, uh, 5 by 10 to save money. Another goal might be emptying a basement to convert, convert it into a home office. Uh, and this last example is actually something a very good friend is working on with her mom. They're trying to clean out a bedroom so that her grandchildren can come and stay overnight because they haven't done that yet. So um, those are all very specific goals that you can work towards. Once you have your goal, then it's time to create a plan. And the first piece of that is to create a timeline or a deadline. It's not necessary, but it's helpful because it creates a little bit of a sense of urgency. Next, you wanna think about resources. So that might include, you might need people to help. Uh, it might be a friend or a family member. Maybe you wanna hire movers. You might need containers or boxes or shelves. And you, there might be various tools you'll need. The other thing to think about is to research and schedule services and pickups. 
For instance, um, at one point, the hospital thrift shop and the light ship basket museum would offer pickup. So you would need to call and schedule that. And sometimes it makes sense to schedule it around when things are coming up. So it's end of summer um, and yard sales are going to be starting. It's a great time to do yard sales. So you might want to plan your project and schedule projects based on what season it is and what's coming up. And then finally, come up with a plan. This can change, but plan times to work and where to start. Um, and this can be a little bit of trial and error. When I work with people, we tend to work about two hours, three hours is really the max. Between that two hour and three hour mark, people tend to stop making decisions and we're just moving stuff around. And if you're working on your own, it might be shorter. So it might be 45 minutes, it might be an hour. Um, so plan how much time you're gonna work and when you're gonna do it. You might say, okay, I get out of work early on Tuesdays and I have all day on Saturdays. So those are the two days I'm gonna work. And it becomes a little bit of a routine. Now, once you have a basic plan, it's time to prep for battle. And this happens right before you start decluttering. You're gonna to wanna to come up with the tools and supplies you have, uh, you'll need. For instance, contractor bags can be great. You can use household trash bags, but sometimes the contractor bags are a little bit heftier for this type of project. Markers can be helpful in case you need to label something. Um, a pen and a notepad. This is actually one of the most important things because what happens is people get started and then they think, oh man, I was supposed to call that person back. And they go upstairs and they call the person back and then they forget what they were doing and they get distracted. So by having a pen and a notepad, you can cre create a to-do list of anything you think of. So you don't have to worry about forgetting it later, but it's not distracting you from the task at hand. Um, and it's a good idea to have tape and scissors in case you need to cut something open, uh, cut open boxes or tape them back up. Next, think about your workspace. So it can, if possible, it can be helpful to have a table or any kind of surface for sorting and have some floor space for piles. I'll get into what the piles are in a moment. Also, think about getting adequate lighting. Um, and actually, I didn't put this on there, but even ventilation, if you're working in a basement or an attic, it's going to allow you to work longer. Um, uh, there's something I work with clients on is energy detractors. So if you don't have enough lights, that's an environmental detractor. It's going to be harder to work. You're gonna, it's just going to drain on you. So make sure you have plenty of light and plenty of ventilation. And um, the final one's optional, but it can help um, having some music for motivation. It might just cr create a better mood. Um, right now I'm working with someone and we declutter to the oldies. And finally, um, right before you start set or before you start set an achievable immediate goal. And they can be time-based or space-based. So a, a time-based goal is working for a certain amount of time. Space-based would be you're going to clear out a certain space. So that would work for say a closet um, or maybe it's your car or um, a small area of the room. You'll work until that space is cleared out. I, when I work with people, it tends to be time-based. And because of that, so I'll break that down a little bit. What you wanna keep in mind is it'll be a little bit of trial and error. So figure out how long you can work. Maybe try 45 minutes. Um, maybe it's an hour and a half, maybe it's two hours. So figure out what works for you and go ahead and set a timer for the allotted time minus 15 or 20 minutes. And what you're gonna do in that last 15 or 20 minutes is you're gonna clean up and you'll tidy up the space. Uh, what I like to do is leave a space as tidy or tidier than when I started. That way when you return to it, um, it's more encouraging as opposed to discouraging. Also, you're gonna wanna put any discarded items, whether um, uh, they're being donated or given away into your vehicle. What this does is it takes away the option to just change your mind later. Lots of times this stuff gets left behind. People dig through the bag and be like, I can't believe I was gonna get rid of this. So go ahead and put it in your vehicle right away. You're more likely to get it to the, the dump or the thrift shop or the friend's house or wherever it's going. Um, and also bring out the trash, anything you can get rid of, bring out because this works exponentially. The more space you have, the more encouraged you are, the more the easier it is to work. So get as much out as you can. 
and then finally decide what your next steps are and when you'll take them. So for instance, you might say, okay, I got that done. The next time we're gonna do this, it's gonna be four days from now at this time. And this space is looking okay, so we're actually gonna move over here next time. Your priorities may shift as you go. Um, actually, I'm gonna pause for a moment. Does anyone have any questions? If you do, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and ask. No? Okay, I'm gonna carry on. Um, so here are some tips for getting started because that's all strategy, but then there's the psychological and emotional factor of like, ugh, all right, I can do this. So if you're feeling that resistance of getting started, here's what I recommend. And if you're working with someone else or supporting someone else, here's something you can share with them. I would say just start somewhere. If I'm working with someone and I can, sometimes they even like physically back up from the space. Um, the first thing I do is just grab something and I say, okay, what about this? Are you keeping it or are you getting rid of it? Because what it'll do is kind of snap them out of that fear and, and give them some forward momentum. So just start, you can always change um, and go someplace else later, but just get started somewhere. The other thing I would say is start with the big stuff and start with the easy stuff. So a big stuff might be a sofa that you know you're gonna get rid of and um, the decision's already made, you just have to get rid of it. So I would say get rid of that because you're creating space to work. <clears throat> I would also say start with the easy stuff. So maybe don't start with pictures and memorabilia and things your kids made. Um, start with something you're gonna be less detached to. And, I'm, and that's gonna be different things for different people. So someone had mentioned clothing. That might be difficult for some people. It might be much easier for other people. So um, start with something that you're not so, that's not so emotionally charged because it'll get you going and create the decision-making habits. I would also say as much as possible, work systematically. So work left to right or top to bottom. And what this does is allows you to see progress. If you're kind of like a butterfly going from flower to flower, you might be, um, getting rid of a lot of stuff and making a lot of decisions, but you may not see that progress at the end. Whereas if you open a storage unit and you start working left to right or back uh, front to back, then when you stop 45 minutes or an hour or whatever it is later, you're going to be able to see the progress you made and it'll be um, psychologically more encouraging. And finally, do your best to make a decision on everything. Pick up every item and do your best to make a decision. One of the worst things you can do for yourself is constantly say, well, I'll decide later. I'll decide later. Later's now. This is what you're doing. You've committed to doing this work and now's the moment to decide. So I tend to give clients a couple passes where they'll say, all right, I'm going to decide later. Um, but lots of times if I hear, you know, say every third item, they're going to, they say, I'm going to decide later. I usually call them on it and say, okay, we really need to be making decisions because you're going to have to decide eventually. Um, and that's why I say start with stuff that's less emotionally charged because it'll allow you to move forward and build some momentum. Okay. I mentioned piles before in the floor space. When you start, I would recommend work in one area and create four piles. The first pile is trash. The second pile is donate or give away. Uh, the third pile is keep but go somewhere else. So if you're working in the basement, you might find something that goes to the kitchen. You don't have to bring it there now. Just put it in that pile that it goes someplace else. And then um, keep and goes here. So those are items that are going to end up where they started, but you're going through everything. making decisions and this is really what decluttering is it's making decision after decision after decision and what i think it's important for people to appreciate is decision making requires a lot of a co cognitive energy um barack obama famously i believe had five charcoal gray suits so when he woke up in the morning he just got dressed because um it, you want to make as few decisions as possible so you can make the important decisions. So really be kind to yourself or the person you're working with and understand that this is going to be a mentally exhausting 
exercise. That's why you want to work in small chunks and, um, and just really understand this can be very exhausting. So here's some of the questions you could ask yourself or ask the person you're working with. Um, do you need this? Do you want this? When was the last time you used it? And when will you use it next time? These are very, um, very rational, logical questions, and it may help take you out of that emotional state and into the logical state. So do you need this? I mean, if it's broken or if it's old or you haven't used it in a while, um, a lot of times when someone has to say it to another person, they're like, you're right, I can get rid of this. So those can be helpful questions. When was the last time you used it? It helps you think about, you know, how much do you really need it? And when will you use it next? That's coming up with a plan. So you're saying, okay, I'm going to keep it. And this is the next time I'm going to use it. Um, and if you don't know that, then maybe you don't need it. You can let it go. Um, what I talked about before, what is it costing you to keep it? Uh, a friend told me about this one. If you saw it at a, saw it at a yard sale for a dollar, would you buy it? Um, and the last question can be really helpful uh, for you or whoever you're helping. Um, when you remember your goal of whatever it is, does it make sense to keep or get rid of this item? So if your goal is to turn your basement into a home office and you have an armchair that you were planning to reupholster for the last six years, if you're turning into an office and you're starting your side business, maybe upholstery isn't the venture you're going into. So understanding what your goal is might help you make, a, um, make that decision. Okay. And once again, I talked about this before, what I look for and what you should look for in yourself and others is are the decisions fear-based or value-based? And now I'm gonna talk about, I got into kind of general scenarios, but I'm going to go over a couple of very common roadblocks that I hear from people. So the first one is, I don't want it to end up in the trash. And I get that. I try to be very environmentally friendly. I try to be sustainable. Um, one of the pieces I help people with is actually getting rid of stuff. And as much as I can, I try to find a home. I try to donate it. If I can take it into pieces and recycle it and compost it, I do that. Um, and be mindful that the landfill is a limited resource. But um, what I want to do with people is make a decision of what their motivation is. So if you could find a new home for it, would you let it go? And if they say yes, then I know they actually don't want the item. They're just trying, they're just, uh, they're making a fear-based decision of, I just don't want it to end up in the trash. And that's okay. I get that piece. But when push comes to shove, you don't actually want it. So that's your decision. You want to get rid of it. Um, and I also ask what will happen when you can no longer keep it. I know I've um, heard from people that have grown children and grandchildren and they kind of reach this point of reality is like my kids don't want this. My kids kids don't want this. So it comes down to do you want to do it on your terms or do you want to just hang on to it until someone else throws it out. Um, I think something to keep in mind is when we don't make a decision, sometimes a decision is made for us. So just, I think it's worth doing a reality check on that and understanding that it's, if it's going to end up in the trash, trash inevitably, then um, are you the one that wants to make that decision or are you going to wait? Another roadblock that people face is it's valuable. Um, here's a few things I might ask or say to them, what value are you getting out of it? So if you've stumbled upon something in your basement that's been there for 15 years and you say, this is really valuable, um, I would argue you're probably not getting a lot of value out of it if it's been sitting under a box for 15 years. So, you know, figure out what value you're getting out of it. If you are, then by all means, keep it. Um, the next thing I might mention is the price is only as much as someone's willing to pay for it. My mom and dad went through this when they were moving to California. My um, grandmother, my dad's mom had passed away and she had all this antique furniture, but a lot of it hadn't been taken care of it. Some of it, some care of, some of it was damaged. And 
when my mom wanted to get rid of something, my dad would be like, but we can't, it's an antique, it's valuable. And she would say, Russell, it's only as valuable as someone's willing to pay for it. So if no one's willing to pay for it, it doesn't matter what dollar, dollar value you put on it, um, the marketplace might say otherwise. Another thing to keep in mind is um, understanding what it'll cost to keep it until you can sell it. So if um, you need to pay to store it somewhere, every dollar you spend storing it, it comes away from that profit you'll get from selling it. And also think about how willing and likely you are to do the work of selling it, especially if it's small items and you're gonna do it, say through the Nantucket consignment Facebook page, it can be a lot of work and you should know that going into it. So you might post someone and someone says, hey, I'm gonna to come today at 5.30 and then they cancel, they come the next morning and then they wanna haggle over the price and then they change their mind. And then you have to take the next person in line and start over. So people have asked, oh, will you help me sell stuff? And I almost always say no, because there's no way to make the numbers work. So they get money and it's worth my time. So understand if you wanna sell stuff and you wanna put the work in either selling it um, on Facebook or eBay, go for it. But please understand that it's gonna be a lot of work and understand whether you're willing to do that work. Another roadblock is I might need it or use it someday. Going back to the fear-based um, statements or decisions. So what I would ask in that situation is how replaceable is it? If it's something really unique and unusual and you wouldn't be able to replace it, I can understand the difficulty of making that decision. Um, once again, what will it cost to keep it? Where will you store it? And when you're honest with yourself, how likely are you to need it or use it? Um, and I think I get to it in the next, actually I'll hold off in the next one. I think I talk about it. I do. So uh, a similar um, roadblock to that one is I'm saving this for when I have time. And another opportunity to get really honest with yourself, when do you predict you'll have time? And if the person says, yeah, uh, I'll have time, you know, Thanksgiving's coming up and I'm not traveling, great. Let's make a plan. Um, and when, when you're honest with yourself, how likely are you to make time? If you've been saying this for six years and it still has never happened, is this something you still wanna do? And if it's not, that's okay. Things change, priorities change. And now give yourself permission to let it go or really double down and make the time to do it. And then the third thing uh, that's important to keep in mind is what are the risks, what risks are there to keeping it? So you might keep something for so long that by the time you get to it, it's obsolete. It might get ruined or moldy. There's been situations where um, someone's basement flooded or they had rodents or any number of problems and the items that were in great shape when they put it down there are now ruined and useless and they go in the garbage. Um, when you have a lot of stuff, you run the risk of losing things or even just forgetting you have it. So lots of times you'll go through a whole bunch of items and say, oh my God, I wish I had this three years ago when I was retiring, this document would have been so helpful. I ended up doing all this legwork. So um, there are risks to having, keeping all your items. Once again, I'm gonna go over the math and physics of decluttering. Rule number one, decluttering is only effective when your rate of accumulation is slower than your rate of disposal. Rule number two, the amount of emotional attachment one feels for physical items neither increases nor decreases the square footage of your available space. Rule number three, monetary and sentimental value minus financial, physical, and emotional cost equals the actual value of your stuff. And just a quick overview of what we talked about, create a goal and a plan for decluttering, prepare for the clean out, just start, and remember to be kind to yourself and to others. So happy decluttering everyone. Um, that's my presentation. I'm gonna go, my contact information is there if you have any questions. And I'm gonna be emailing everyone this presentation, but right now I'm gonna stop my share and I'm gonna open it up to questions. Does anyone have any comments or questions? Oh, and just go ahead and unmute yourself. I muted everyone. Hi, Janet, I have a question. Sure. 
I, it's my understanding that the thrift shop uh, is no longer, is, is not accepting anything. Uh, is, can you tell us any place to take donations these days? Yes, so the hospital thrift shop is not taking donations. I believe the second shop is, but only on Mondays. I would call and verify okay. that. And the other place you can take it is um, uh, Island Treasures, which is down by N Magazine uh, yes. and Emma Ross Salon. And then the other place, um, oh, I wish I had thought to look into this. The Family Resource Center, um, sometimes they will take clothes and I believe toys. I, I would always recommend calling ahead so you don't make the trip for nothing. But I believe yes. they're where, um, located where Island Variety used to be. And I'm sure you can find them online pretty easily. And I believe they will take some donations. Thank you. This is a helpful presentation. Oh, thank you. I, yeah, I, um, because the library, I don't believe we're taking books. Mm -hmm. Is the um, take it or leave it open now? It is not open, but um, an insider tip if you've been to the dump, um, Nantucketers are a force not to be reckoned with and there is a um, impromptu take it or leave it set up uh, if you look where the glass bin is and the Nernick bin, the non-recyclable, non-compostable, um, there is a small pile there. So I wouldn't bring a truckload, but if you had, say, two um, shopping bags, you could leave them there. I don't know how, uh, how regulated it is, but I have dropped, you know, two shopping bags there and haven't had a problem. My other question is how to deal with photographs that you never put in albums um, and that you have boxes of yeah. photographs and memories to mm -hmm. um, get to organize or, or just. Yeah. Um, yeah. Photographs are hard, right? Um, so one option is to digitize, which can be its own. Um, uh, can of worms because <laughs> you end up just virtually uh, cluttering. But um, one option is to look into digitizing it. I know my sister had uh, a lot of albums from middle school and high school and college and she actually just put them in the mail and they uh, company would digitize everything and send her, I think they sent her a disc or maybe a thumb drive, drive that's one option. Um, Another option that I did, I mean, I had the ben benefit or misfortune of moving a lot. So when you have to pick up sticks and, and go places, you tend to um, lighten your load. And one of the things I did is, you know, every year or so, or like each time I moved, I, ha I whittled it down to about three or four boxes of memorabilia, like scrapbooks and um, cards and pictures. And I'd go through and say, okay, these are essentially 10 pictures of the same thing which one's my favorite? Like which one really cap captures the moment? And that's an instance um, where I would do it in chunks and you don't have to get any of this done in a day. So I would say pick a time once a week if there's a TV show you really like or a radio show you really like and work for about 45 minutes and then give yourself permission to stop. And you'll be surprised if at how, how quickly it can move along when you work in chunks and then you're less likely to feel overwhelmed to get discouraged, but you actually get quite a lot done. And I think people get much better and I guess ruthless for lack of a better word as they go through. Um, it just becomes a practice of deciding what's really important to you and what's not. Um, so I would say just um, set some time aside and just start whether it's 30 minutes or 45 minutes, whatever makes sense to you. Anyone else? Thank you. I have a question about paper uh -huh. uh, and related to tax returns. I understand that you must keep tax returns forever, but what about the supporting documentation for tax returns? Ooh, um, that, uh, uh, I'm hesitant to advise. I would recommend calling an accountant um, or you could even look on the IRS website my understanding, um, disclaimer, I'm not an accountant or a lawyer. My, my understanding is seven years for taxes. So you want to keep everything 
um, for seven years and then you're good to go to throw everything out or shred it, shred it would be safer. Thank you. Mm -hmm. There is a um, new Facebook thing called uh, Don't Buy Nantucket or something like that, where you give, where it's, everything is free. Oh, right. It's called, um, yeah, I know what you're talking about and I can't think of, uh, buy nothing. Buy nothing. And it's a, I think it's nationwide by town. So oh. our called Buy Nothing Nantucket. Yeah, it's a great resource. And I mean, I'm working with someone, I mean, if you just want to go rogue, I'm working with someone now and they're actually, um, he and his girlfriend are moving. And what they do is every few days they set up a, like a free yard sale. Um, and they're like, they're shocked at what people will take right off the side of the road if it's free. Um, so if you're, you're just trying to, if you're not money motivated, but you just want stuff to find a new home, um, yeah, there's lots of creative ways to go about it. But yeah, the Buy Nothing Facebook page is a good one. There's also Reuse Exchange. They have a free seg section as well as the art sale section and for sale. Stuff. Yes, and I, I used to use that all. I sold a car on that. I, I think Facebook kind of took over and I forgot that that existed. But yes, that's an excellent resource. Yeah. Um, let's see, I have a question in the chat. Do you have any tips for helping and encouraging older relatives who are borderline hoarders um, and helping to encourage them to declutter? Yes, that is a, um, that can be very tricky and very charged. Um, so I think, I think the first thing to do as hard as it can be is to, um, reduce your judgment a little bit and bring as much compassion to the situation as you can. Um, I imagine the person, I know very few people that have a ton of stuff um, and things have built up and they're like, look at all my stuff. Isn't it awesome? Like, I mean, I think people tend to feel already a little bit ashamed and a little bit embarrassed as much as um, you can bring compassion and kindness to it, which I know can be hard. And the other thing is to sit down and come up with, um, try to get on the same page and come up with a goal because that was actually really helpful for my friend. She's been, her parents have struggled with, um, I guess you could call it hoarding or collecting and um, really letting their house get out of control. And she's gotten really frustrated. Um, but what helped her most recently is she sat down and asked her mom like, you know, what would you get out of decluttering? And what her mom said is it really bothers her that her grandchildren don't stay over her house. And so that became this common goal um, for them to address the problem and it helped them move forward. So I think if you can work with your relative to understand and, and kind of reach a common goal and something to work towards, I think that can be helpful. I think also, I would go back to the questions. I know it seems, um, I know it's really easy to walk into a space and be like, what's wrong with you? Can't you see this is garbage? And the answer is no, they can't see that. They're very attached to these items. They're seeing it very differently than you are. But I think if you can walk in with that list of questions and say, all right, well, tell me how you value this. Tell me why this is important. Tell me what you'll do with it. Um, and once again, without judgment, um, but it kind of puts them, it gives them some agency over the decision making, as opposed to feeling like people are taking things away from them. They're choosing what's happening with the stuff. And I think um, it can be slow, it can be frustrating, but I, I do think that's the most effective way to move forward. I don't know if that was helpful. And there are, if you do feel, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not, um, trained to diagnose hoarding. Hoarding is, um, would be considered a disorder and people can fall anywhere along that spectrum. Um, there are uh, support groups um, for that. A lot of times if it is, you know, hoarding as a disorder, there's a lot more going on other than the person is a little disorganized. <laughs> um, and I think it's important to recognize that. So there's um, lots of professional help out there for someone who, uh, if you believe this person is, um, has a hoarding disorder. 
could I put in a plug for let's have more yard sales, please? <laughs> <laughs> I need some stuff, some small stuff. And you can advertise for free on Reuse Exchange. Mm -hmm. And the Facebook page, Nantucket, I think it's Nantucket Yard Sales. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to urge people to consider that and maybe even drum up a neighborhood yard sale, which are really popular. Mm -hmm. But social distancing and masks, of course. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Yes. And I have, I know one person in particular that's um, planning to have a yard sale. So I, I imagine um, tis the season, September and October. Any other questions, thoughts? Uh, yes? I, I, when we moved, um, I spent a lot of time organizing things that probably weren't that important. Mm -hmm. So I organized my kids' stuff, and, the, and I'll pop, you know, their high school, junior high, high school, college, and they don't want it, and I probably won't look at it again. I mean, it's not something, I might look at it again, but it's not something I'll look at once. Oh, some of that stuff. Um, it's the emotional, it's the history um, of stuff that's, so do you just need to have tough love kind of, or out of yeah. sight, out of mind? Yeah, you know what, there's, um, so there's two books, I, and actually one's a documentary I'd recommend. One is The Story of Stuff by um, Annie Leonard, let me put that in chat. Um, and she, I think she talks a little bit about that, but she also just talks about understanding stuff, where it comes from, and kind of gives you a good reality check. Um, let's see. And then the other one, um, the kind of more famous one, uh, whose coattails I'm riding, is Marie Kondo, who wrote, uh, I think it's the magical, it's like the magical gift of tidying up. Or If you look up Marie Kondo, I'll put her name in here. Uh, she had a show and everything. And her book, um, she's, she has a very extreme approach, which I think can work if you have a crew and you're co really committed to doing it in one full swoop. Um, the reason I like to work in sessions is I'm not committed to spending a whole weekend at someone's house uh, or a week for that matter. And I don't know that that approach works for everyone. So I like working in chunks. But one chapter in her book that is worth reading, whether you get it at the library or whatever, is about memorabilia. She really does... Um, I found her approach to that really helpful when it comes to, you know, gifts and, and pictures and scrapbooks. And, um, I mean, I can, speaking from personal experience, my parents, um, they, uh, let's see, five years ago, they moved to California, which was a big move. It, it kind of was like, we can't take everything. So what's important. And my sisters and I had had the fortune of just leaving a bunch of stuff in the attic. And my mom reached point, she said, we're moving, the stuff is here, you can come get it, or it's going in the garbage. So it did, for me, motivated me to go and um, get my stuff and go through it. And that actually, I was able to grab it. And since I had it all out, it wasn't hiding somewhere. I took the opportunity to go through it box by box and really pare a lot of it down. Um, How do you spell her last name, please? Oh, Marie Kondo. Um, K-O-N-D-O. Okay. Yeah. And I would say a, a big piece of it is working on the front end, um, is being aware, you know, thinking about what you're buying. When I had to move and gave up a lot of stuff and I knew I'd be moving frequently, um, you know, I think long and hard about buying stuff. Uh, very few things come into my house that I don't like absolutely need. And lots of times if I'm buying something substantial uh, that isn't gonna be used up, say a book that I'll give away or food or whatever, um, lots of times I'll ask myself, if I have to move in three years, do I wanna carry this with me? Uh, and many times the answer is no. So that can be a huge piece of it is working on the front end and not um, acquiring so much. Any other thoughts, comments?
Another question. Sure. My 50 year old daughter still has many, many boxes of her treasures in my attic. How do I approach her in a del delicate, tactful way to come and get rid of this stuff? <laughs> I'm, I'm hesitant to throw it out, no. but, but she always has a reason why she can't come and deal with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, yes. I mean, yes, that's tricky. I think some of it is creating that accountability and drawing that line, line in the sand of like, you know, here's the end, here's the deadline and finding something that's realistic. Like you don't want to set her up for failure, but, um, maybe talking with her and agreeing, okay, this is what I need. And this is my reason for moving forward. So I'm willing to give you three months or whatever it is to sort this out, what would work for you? And maybe you guys can find a solution um, together. And um, it's tricky though. But yeah, I mean, some of it just comes down to accountability and willing to draw a line in the sand. Is that helpful? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's hard though, I get it. I mean, it's heartbreaking because you can't undo it. Um, like if I, you know, a wine glass breaks or whatever, you can always go to Bed Bath and Beyond and buy more. But when it's stuff that's irreplaceable, it can be hard. Um, but it's also, it's not necessarily your burden to bear. I'm thinking of calling Mainland Connection to deliver it to her. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It is that, so the chapter is really good with Marie Kondo because it is a memorabilia. I mean, I, can, I have wedding gifts. I've been married just 50 years on Sunday. And I can look at things that I use or things that I don't use and I know who gave them to me. And we've, tra mm -hmm. we've traveled a, a fair amount and I have, yeah, just fun things that make me happy kind of. Mm -hmm. but, but like some of the stuff I don't, I don't have on display or I don't have, you know, that kind of, but um, yeah, I've got a great memory and yeah. And so if it makes you happy, do you keep it? Yeah. Well, that's what Marie Kondo would argue. Her thing is if it sparks joy. <laughs> oh, uh, but that doesn't get rid of stuff though either. <laughs> I think also one thing to think about is um, the person who gave it to you 50 years ago um, if they're still around, they may or may not remember. So there's that piece. Let go of the guilt. It's, it's okay. They'll forgive you. Um, is it serving a purpose? Like, is it something you have on display and you walk by every day? Is it in a box that you open on your anniversary? I mean, then for sure. But if it's something that's sitting in the bottom of nowhere that you may forget about, you may never use, um, I think it's okay to let things go. Um, and it doesn't mean you'll forget, like it's, I think it reaches a point where things have served their purpose. They've brought all the joy that you're gonna get out of them. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it's like, it almost becomes this tipping point of like, I'm enjoying it, I'm enjoying it. Oh, it's a burden, why do I still have this? Where am I gonna keep it? So just understanding where you fall on that. Um, no, thank you, that's helpful. I think, I mean, for a lot of people, they just need someone to look them in the eye and be like, you're not a bad person. You can throw that out. <laughs> I mean, some people just need permission. <laughs> um, and I mean, I could actually, there was one client, she had something from her mother-in-law and um, she's like, I can't possibly get rid of it. And I said, well, when is she going to come visit? And she said next summer. And I think this was fall. I said, tell you what, put it in the drawer. And if she comes next summer and she doesn't ask about it, then how would you feel about giving yourself permission to get rid of it? Um, because I get that, like, are they gonna show up and notice that you don't have it? And there are those scenarios, but I think we think people remember things much better than we do when they actually do. <laughs> so thank you so much for being here tonight. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I enjoyed myself. I love talking and hearing stories and what people have and what they're struggling with. <laughs> so, thank you very thank you, much. Janet. It, it was helpful. Thank you. Yeah.
Yeah, you're so welcome. So uh, maybe we'll do this again in a few months and everyone can come back and tell me how they did. Um. <laughs>